is Shadowland, a new podcast experience from this Jungian life that explores the lives of people who work and take refuge in the hidden places of our culture. Lisa, Deb, and Joseph collaborate with songwriter Wells Hanley, creator of I Wrote This Song For You podcast, to bring insight, compassion, and and understanding to the darker side of human experience. Nietzsche wrote, I am a forest and a night of dark trees, but he who is not afraid of my darkness will find banks full of roses under my cypresses. In that spirit, we meet Kay, a 21-year-old single mother who works throughout the American Southwest as a prostitute. We explore how she found her way to that life, what she aspires to, and how she holds the complicated tensions between herself, her clients, and the current culture. We shared this interview with Wells, who was moved to create a song for Kay. We hope you'll be as touched by her story as we were. So, Kay, I was wondering, can you just tell us a little bit about your story? Okay. I, I grew up in West Virginia. Uh, I grew up with a single dad. My mom uh, and him separated when I was a baby. I, I did. I had like a stint, a pretty long stint with uh, drug addiction in uh, my late teens. Um, I did the whole rehab thing like where you know like i think a lot of people get caught in in the rehab cycle where they're in and out and in and out and i was definitely into that and then eventually uh my my dad uh fair enough had 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 enough and he you know cut me off and i was living in new mexico or not living there you know i guess at that i started living there at this point um but i was in a, a center there and uh actually got kicked out of that one but um long story. But anyway, so I was in New Mexico and like needed a place to stay. And like, I, I think I had always heard about this as an option, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's something that you do here in like, you know, the periphery, but I definitely knew how to do it, right? I mean, everything's on the internet now. So I, I went online and started working and very, very quickly was introduced to ways of working that were more lucrative and, and more enjoyable and, uh, found myself involved in it. Uh, of course, I uh, ended up um, getting into a relationship with a client. Um, and so I took some time off, uh, had a kid. And then when that, that relationship ended, I started working again. And I'm, I'm just wanting to back up a little bit. You said you, you know, had this experience of being addicted. Did that happen? You said late teens. Did that happen when you were in high school? Or I, I know you mentioned some college. Just, just talk a little bit about yeah, that. Yeah. So I, um, I graduated high school early, actually. Um, I graduated at, yeah, so I was 17 years old when I graduated. Uh, and then there was a period of time because I had graduated early where I wasn't in college yet. And I just didn't really have anything to do. So during that period of time, um, uh, my grandmother died. Um, and then I just started have, I mean, I'd already had, I think some emotional uh, anxiety type issues. Um, you know, obviously like, you know, abandonment issues, I'm sure. Yeah. I think during that time I, I started, you know, doing what was around me, which, you know, in West Virginia was a lot of, a lot of heroin. And that really, I think for me, it was it was really more of an expression of suicidality. Like I would say that that's that's true um, for a lot of the people I knew who were involved in that world. Mm -hmm. um, my my very best friend actually uh, he passed about yeah it was rough it was so rough. Um, we had like the same birthday and like yeah it was I right right and it was so rough it was so rough. But um, he had always explained it to me in the same way that that I think I always felt about it, which was it. It was very much like a Russian roulette type thing. And oh, yeah, God. yeah. And so I think that I, I was in that sort of mindset for a, a long time and pretty much until I was cut off and sort of had to grow up in, in a lot of ways. I, I'm just back on what it was like growing up in West Virginia <laughs> and uh, your grandmother dying and this right. uh, culture and wondering if you right. were, you said you were anxious, but uh, it sounds 
unhappy. Well, my grandmother who died was, uh, she was in Puerto Rico. So my mom came to uh, this country from Puerto Rico when I was, or not, uh, like two months before I was born, pretty much. Um, so she, like she was fresh off the boat when I was a baby. That That's a whole other issue, right? And like there's tons of, uh, tons of stuff to get into in terms of just like being Puerto Rican and, and all the, all the stuff that goes along with that, especially in this country where it's, it's crazy and heated and there's so much history, um, especially sexually, you know, there's so much history. Yeah. That's, that's a whole other thing. But um, I, I felt very disconnected, I think and because I was right. I mean, I, I definitely, I didn't have a connection with like my, my maternal side of my family at all. Um, and then, you know, my dad, my dad is adopted um, and so he never felt like neither he or I felt a really strong connection with his family. Um, the culture wasn't, I mean, I lived in the, in one of the best places in West Virginia you could live in. And it, it was still pretty like, there just wasn't a lot there. There wasn't a whole lot of options for like, and things to do or just like, like, like I'd never like heard of like, any of the stuff that I see in like the big cities that I spend my time in today. So mm, it's just, mm-hmm. it was just very different. I I'm just want to go back to one thing. How did you come to graduate from high school early? Um, I was just really good at school. Um, <laughs> I had like, I mean, I just like naturally always was just very good at it. Like it just, mm-hmm. it was very easy for me to do schoolwork. Like I love worksheets, you know what I mean? Like, like I'm, just, <laughs> I'm the type of person who like, I just love, simple things like that where like you know what to do and so i i think i did a lot of like i start, started really early with like doing a lot of like high school credits and like getting all that done i mean i just like didn't have anything else to do so i just graduated uh a little over a semester early okay but but college wasn't a good fit for you it would have been i think actually um or actually i don't know i think i had a problem with and this is sort of self-righteous but I just like, just, I think I actually wanted to like learn stuff, right? Like, like to me, like that's very like, like that's sort of like what I would want to do. And, and I just definitely didn't feel a whole lot of like connection with a lot of the other students as much. I think I, I felt like no one else was taking it as seriously, which is so self-righteous. But, but I mean, I definitely just felt like it wasn't like really what it could be. I don't know. I I definitely just didn't feel, I mean, of course I didn't go to a good school, right? Like, which is like, P- problem number one like my and this is part of the issue um i was telling you guys before we started recording where my father was very financially controlling i had one option to go to school and like nothing else was even on the table so right so i mean like it wasn't even like a choice like it was in the town i'd always grown up in it was like wasn't yeah yeah it just wasn't gonna it wasn't gonna be mm-hmm. what it needed to be for me at that point so mm-hmm. But now I'm in debt. <laughs> right. <laughs> You're in debt because you went to college. Right. And yeah, yeah, and and I didn't get any like I didn't get I got some credits but obviously not in, enough. So mm-hmm. yeah, so mm-hmm. now I'm sort of in that position where you have to you have to pay back your debt before they'll even give you financial aid again. So yeah, yeah right. It's so frustrating. Could have been that trap. Yeah, it's not I'm not in that much debt um but it's it's enough. <laughs> there's there's a a theme that I'm curious about, okay? Mm-hmm. That um, when you describe being raised in this small backwater in West Virginia, when you describe school, when you describe college, the term or the the feeling that pervades it is sounds like boredom. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I guess boredom in a way. Yeah, I mean, I guess. I guess I, the thing is, is I'm I don't enjoy excitement. I, I think, like especially you know now with my job, I obviously I travel a lot. I'm always on the move. And I definitely don't like that, but I think I'm the type of person who needs it. You know, like I just, I sort of need to be sort of constantly on the move or constant, like there needs to be something going on, even though I don't mm. totally uh, enjoy it all that much. It sounds like what you crave is engagement. Yes, absolutely. That's a perfect way to word it. Mm-hmm. And that's what you didn't have when right. you first went to college. Right. There was just no engagement. Or growing up. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, I, maturity has to be forced, I think, a lot of the times. I don't, I don't think that anyone is just going to like naturally, if left like to their own devices, just like be a mature person because it sort of sucks a lot of the time. Right. Like, yeah, it's sure, not fun, absolutely. but um, especially at first, you know, like it sort of sucks. Right. So I think that 
a lot, and lot, especially nowadays with like the the culture around being in college, there's no, I mean, it's so infantilizing. And I just, mm-hmm. I couldn't get down with that. So there you are, you're 18, you're in New Mexico, your dad's just cut you right. off, you have no money, right. no place to stay that night. And you think, why don't I try this? Well, yeah. So I tried some other things first. Um, okay. I tried to work on a farm. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> that did not go well. I'm not built for that. Um, I I, uh, I tried some other things first. I definitely, it wasn't the first thing that came to my mind. And actually, I was hanging out with this woman who was like an old school street walker, right? Like old school. And it just, I, I saw what she was doing and it just occurred to me there are better ways to do this. Like you definitely, this is not how you have to do it nowadays. And she, she just didn't even know, right? Like, it's like some people, you know, if you're not involved in like the culture as it develops, like you'll stay in the seventies. And um, so it was, it was really crazy to me to, to see her just like not even know that you could go online and do this like that. But I mean, she learned obviously, you know, I taught her, but um, I think it was definitely a interesting and beneficial relationship for both of us. Uh, even though it was short lived. Um, and and I just it just gave me the idea really like oh this mm-hmm. is something that you can actually do and I mean even at that level you can make enough money to like to to live you know and so as you considered it what were the different reactions that you had what were the thoughts and the feelings that came up if you remember you know, I I do remember and I also remember that there weren't that many I mean it was very much like you know almost like in, the, in that military kind of mindset like this is what you got to do you know I mean there, I didn't really especially at that point give myself a whole lot of permission, I guess, to just like really even have different thoughts and feelings about it. It was just like, this is what you have to do. So, I mean, that those came later, right? And I definitely like dealt with those later as they came. But um, initially, it was just, it was a survival. Mm-hmm. It was survival. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've spoken about, um, you know, your discovery that you really do like this work. Yeah, yeah, that is, um, especially, uh, that's much more recent. So, uh, of course, after I had my kid, I, I stopped for a while. And then when I re-entered, it was from a place of, I wasn't struggling to survive, right? Like, I have, my, my, my needs were met, like, I was comfortable. And so I had the time and resources to just do it really intelligently, to just do it really intelligently. So because of that, um, it changed how I did it, right? So like I, the clients I was seeing were not people who viewed me as objects, right? Or mo- most of the time, most of the time. The resources that I had, like the places I was staying, it was just so different. Everything was different and it's much more enjoyable. Like I knew at, at the point when I re-entered the business that that I could say no, right? Like I didn't have to say yes to anything I didn't want to do. And now, I mean, I don't, I really don't even see clients unless I genuinely enjoy the sex, right? So like that is completely different from how it was when I started. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it's, if I don't like, if I'm not going to get off, I'm not going to see you. Do you know what I mean? And and so like, that is a completely Mm -hmm. different um, way of doing it. And it's, Mm -hmm. it's, yeah, it's fun. I mean, like it's fun to feel good, you know, I mean, when it feels good, right? Of course, like there are, obviously there are days when, I just don't feel like having sex, right? Like, and like that you still have to. And I think part of the the thing and sort of like the trick of it is just realizing like, ha- like it's not, it's not the way that it would be if this wasn't my job, if that makes sense, right? Like this is my job and I have to do it because I have to like feed my kid and I have to like, ha- you know, like survive and I have to live. But it's not like the same thing that it would be if I was having sex I didn't want to have in my personal life, if that makes sense. Because like that's something, like that is something, right? And like that's just very different. Well, it sounds like the transactional aspect sometimes is actually very helpful. Oh. That you just go into a mode of uh, this, is, this is the deal. This is a business transaction, and I think that what's helpful for me in those moments is the fact that you do create, especially with, you know, a lot of this is is marketing, right? <laughs> like, you, like you have to be so much. It's so much depends on how you market yourself. I mean, it is crazy how much it is all dependent on that and so part of that marketing is you know you create this persona and it's very easy to in those moments where i i can't really show up for this like you have this persona that you've created and it's it's helpful on the days when 
you know, I don't really feel like I have like that, that like I can't authentically show up, I think for, for the job, because I mean, I, I, when I can do that, I want to do that. Right. Like I want to be myself enjoying the situation, but if that can't happen, like, of course, because of the, the persona that I've created for the marketing, yeah, I just slip into that. It's, it's very much like almost like an acting job in a way in those times. Like I, I've definitely thought about it before. Like your job is to be an actress right now. Right. Like, and, and that persona is helpful. And also, it's also helpful for me to, to sort of, and this has helped me a lot in terms of like making money is just like, what is this guy into? Right. And then sort of reflecting that back, sort of like allowing them to like narcissistically almost like project onto you, whatever it is that they're interested in. And then, I mean, it's pretty easy to just play that role and not. Mm, mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. what, what is your, I'm curious about two things. What is your persona and how did you acquire that term? Very Jungian term. Is it? Um, I mean, it's very close to who I am, actually. I mean, it's it's not honestly all that different. I think it's just someone who just like really, I think the only difference would be that I, I definitely like portray myself as being hypersexual, which in actuality, in my personal life, like not at all, actually. I mean, I, I, not even a little bit. Like I'm definitely one of those people who like could go months without sex. I just don't care. Like I just don't need sex in my life. But like this persona totally not like that at all right and like that's really the whole point of it is like just being able Mm -hmm. to get myself in a mindset where like no i actually want to do this even though Mm -hmm. totally maybe not Mm -hmm. what's going on Mm -hmm. so you said there are good days and bad days tell us about uh, tell us about what a good day is like and why you like it you know it's it's really hard to do this job and not sort of be a little bit materialistic um (laughs) a little bit right like it it's sort of like you know you're this is in your face and it's for money. Right. And so like, you know, I think the value of money sort of goes up and um, way up. So, mm. I mean, I like shopping. I like bougie hotels. You know, I mean, I like, <laughs> I do, I can't even lie. Like I, I, I was at like the store the other day and I was like, Oh, honestly, like the best part of this job is the lingerie. Like, like, you know what I mean? Like, like, and it's just like, you know, I like, sh- I, I like that stuff. You know, I, I think I didn't grow up with any of that. So my family did not grow up with any of that nothing even close right like i mean both of my both sides of my family were extremely extremely poor my mother you know in puerto rico i mean it's it was at that especially not that long ago i mean it's it's a you know third world country so it's it was rough right so for me like i'm like oh this is so nice you know um and i definitely overspend right i'm definitely terrible with with the money that i make i should make that very clear but um on, on the good days it's just it's good to feel like like you have abundance right it's good to feel like like there's enough for sure and and you know to feel like i can provide for myself and for like my kid right like like buying whatever she could ever need or want like being able to like buy you know like it's just nice right so so financial independence (laughs) in abundance yes yes security Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely absolutely um and then the other thing is like you know you're getting constant compliments right like if you're doing this in the best way that you can and you know and everything is going as it should. I mean, you're treated really, really well, right? Like really well, like, you know, like it's constantly all day, like, oh, like you're a princess, like blah, 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 right? Like you're beautiful, you're, you know, all these compliments all day. And that that can be a trap too, right? Because like, I think for sure, you know, um, I've noticed that on bad days when it's like 4.30 and everyone in my city is in traffic and I know that's what they're doing, right? Like, they're all in traffic and I'm not getting like those constant messages. You know, it definitely, you know, in those moments you realize like, Oh, like my self-worth is probably a little bit too tied up in like this constant stream of validation that I get. It's nice when you're getting it still, you know, it's, it feels good. Well, I think I hear one of the things you're saying is that you receive these really beautiful projections, you know? Yeah. Yeah. A little bit. And, and sometimes that does feel really good. Right. But it's not authentic. Right. Like, um, it, they are just a lot of the times they're, they're just projections. I I would say that every once in a while, you know, um, I'll have like a regular client who, who, you know, I'm a little bit more authentic with and, and then sometimes, you know, I think some, some of them are a little bit more, more real, but yeah, a lot of times like, like the compliments that I get when I actually think about it, I'm like, that's actually not even true. (laughs) Right. Like, like, I'm not even like that, like, but it, you know, the dopamine still gets released. So I don't know. (laughs) I'm thinking a lot about how much this is about various kinds of persona. 
and uh, you t- tuning in too to your client's sort of fantasy world and the kind of persona that that this particular uh, man has, what he's into, the lingerie, the clothes, the compliments. And we all have a persona, and, and, we, and we need one to both al- allow us to adapt to the world and to protect ourselves. But it does feel a lot like like acting, like like playing, like make believe, or something along those lines. I mean, it's just acting. Like it's it's there. You have to you have to act like you're enjoying it. I mean, you don't have to, right? But you won't make money. You won't make good money. So I think that that's the difference between acting and then not acting, right? Because there are girls, and like I've had bad days where. Uh, there's no denying that I'm not into it, right? Like I definitely know that my client knows I'm not into it. And first off, I feel like guilty almost in those situations, right? Because like that's actually not like I feel like my job is to do a little bit more than that, right? Especially with like the amount that you know I'm, I'm charging, like like that. It's just I feel, you know I feel like I need to show up more than that. And I think that it's just not it's it's not fun for anyone, right? Like if I if it's obvious that I don't want to do it, like no one's having a great time. So I think that it's just, it's actually more enjoyable for me if I'm, if I'm at, like, you know, in that persona and it's safer too, right? Because like that persona might be more assertive that and that persona might be able to say no to things and with a little bit more tact and uh, <laughs> like, you know, just with a little bit more firmness than I think I normally would. Cause I'm very accommodating. <laughs> I think like, like, you know, like my actual self, I'm very, very accommodating. Um, and you can't be like that in, in this business. So, And what, you know, are the trends or patterns? How would you articulate? Uh, what are the needs of, of the people that you are serving? I think about this a lot, uh, a lot, actually, because, I mean, obviously, it's what I do with every day. But I think a lot of men are very insecure. And not even in like a, a bad, dangerous way. It's just uh, I've definitely noticed, especially like younger, and by younger I mean like under forty-five, right? Like <laughs> younger men, uh, you know, you definitely notice that they're just insecure, and, and like they just don't they 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 just want the validation, right? Like a lot they, of they want to be desired. Yeah, they want to know that they're doing okay, like that they're no. like good. You know what I mean? Like a lot of it, I, I'm always very surprised with how much clients come in and sexually, like they're not actually receiving that much at all, right? right. Like that's they don't even want that. Like they they just want to feel like they're making someone happy, mm. and and that's most of what I get actually. Like I, wow, yeah, and I never would have expected that either. Like and I mean, like it's fine for me, right? Like I'm having a great time, but like it's just it's really interesting because it's it's like they don't even want to be on the receiving end. Like they just want to sit there and like have me enjoy myself, which is really interesting to me. Like why, like I don't totally even get it. Um, but I definitely know like that that's what a lot of them are into. Hmm. Um, I mean, honestly, it's so much of it is that. And I think the other thing is like, they want connection. Like a lot of them, especially the married guys, the married guys feel like they and they they all love their wives. I should say that. Like, that's a really big thing for me. Like they talk about their wives constantly and they love that. Like they are super into them, but they just, you know, th- there's this need that's unmet and they can't, they feel like they can't address it. And there's mm. all sorts of other things going on with that, which I get to hear all about. Um, and I think a lot of them just want a place where they can just like get what they feel like is this physical need met so that they can go and like be respectful and be, you know, not like a, like a pig with their wives. But this is, I think, such an important uh, dimension that we call shadow, Mm -hmm. that these men, they're in a marriage and there's parts of their own sexuality, parts of their personality that they've cut off, that they believe um, would be rejected if they had brought it forward to their wives, their marriages. And then they get a chance to bring it to you. So, so what are the kinds of secret needs that married men are bringing to you that they feel they cannot offer into the marriage? Just a level of like excitement, right? Like their wives probably aren't like, I mean, understandably, right? Like, like I, I was in a relationship. I had a kid. I get it. Like, you don't want to, I was not interested. You know what I mean? Like, I just like, wasn't at that point. And 
it's a rough situation. I don't necessarily have any advice for that. Obviously, I'm 21, but uh, you know, they they just want to feel like they're making someone excited and and that they're making someone like someone's like in, like really into it, right? And and it's exciting. It's new. They they're not supposed to be doing it, right? Like they have to lie about it, and that adds, I'm sure, like a whole. A whole thing. The fact that you're spending money on someone, right? Like it makes the it makes their value in your head go up. I think, right? Because like like they're they're dropping big bucks, so like this must be a better sexual experience than what I would get with someone that I could have for free. And that's not true at all, right? But it's definitely I think in their head. The other thing is I would say just like 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 there's like the personal problems i mean like it's like really individual like oh like my friend said this and like just like really like almost high schoolish like childish not in a bad way but just like you know it's like random so drama. so your your clients share their personal problems with you oh is yeah. that common um yeah i would say i would say about like 50% of the of the clients that i have share their personal issues some, some way more than others so they're they're also bringing needs for uh, emotional connection and intimacy into the transaction. Yeah, absolutely. Um, especially like I think the very social guys, um, like they they definitely I feel like they feel like they always. I mean I don't know I don't know what they feel, but they definitely like to me they want they just want someone to talk to that isn't involved. You know, like just like a completely unbiased like. I don't really give a crap like what's going on with you. So like, you can just tell me whatever. Right. And then I'm just going to be honest with you. And I think that they appreciate that because they don't always feel like they have that. They feel like they, you know, I mean, you know, you can't just tell people whatever you want, right? Like people react. And so to have someone who doesn't have the real ability or, or motivation to react in any way that's going to affect you, I'm sure feels really good. There's also a phenomenon of, that, that I track when I'm working with people that I refer to as shadow bonding, that when two people are doing something that is socially transgressive, you're stepping out of the social norm and you meet each other in that secret place, that there's something deeply intimate about, about breaking the social rule together. It's bonding. It's a very intimate experience with, with clients. I mean, it's, I think authentically, like very intimate, like, and yeah, mm-hmm. uh, I mean, sort of regardless of what else is going on or what even they're specifically coming to me with, it's almost always a very deep connection, at least in that moment. And I think a lot of them, like, I mean, it's, you're physically with someone, right? Like, 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 like you can't really get any closer. And a lot of these guys are, they're very insecure about their bodies as well, right? Like they're, they're not 20, you know, <laughs> they're, they're not 20. And, and I, I personally actually think a lot, a lot of my clients are way more attractive than they think. And I think to, to, to be that way and then to have someone accept you and actually like get joy out of that with you. I mean, I think that to a lot of them, like that's, that's really what they're there for is they, they need to be validated. They need to be seen completely like, and then have someone be like, I'm into it. And what is it like for you to give that to someone? I mean, it, it, I don't really feel like I'm giving them anything even, you know what I mean? I just feel, I mean, cause I'm not, I'm not, it's, it's just, it's the truth. I mean, for me, you know what I mean? Like it, it I, it's very authentic for me. Like it, I most, I mean, and I just, I've just been really, especially recently, I've been very lucky with like the clients that I've gotten, like they've all been pretty, I mean, pretty attractive, right? Like at, at this point, like, I find like 45 year old men to be like super hot. So like <laughs> I do and <laughs> that's probably its own thing, but I mean, I'm into it, you know? So it, it feels like I'm just like bringing things to where they should be, honestly. You know, I, mean, mm. I definitely don't feel like I'm. And how is that for you? What does that feel it, like I mean, for you? Good. Yeah. I mean, I guess it feels good. I mean, I don't ever, I mean, I guess I don't really think about it. I mean, I guess, yeah, I guess it feels good. I mean, it definitely, it definitely doesn't feel negative at all. You know, I mean, it's just, uh, it feels like, it feels like a good way to, to go about being, I guess. I, I'm uh, thinking about how um, you're bringing and speaking a level of honesty in all this, that your clients can be themselves. They can be validated. Uh, they bring some aspect of themselves that is shadow for them to be accepted, to be validated, to have their needs be welcomed. Right. 
Uh, so maybe I'm thinking about Joseph. Your term of uh, shadow bonding is very interesting, and and that somewhere in that shadow bonding is a level of of real honesty. Of it's not pretending that this is lifelong love. That's its own thing as well, though, right? Like there are a lot of clients who aren't, especially ones who aren't in relationships, where it, and this is where I run into actually the most problems in this business is people who who think that they're in love with me and it's and it sounds crazy to say that right like it sounds ridiculous but it's it is the biggest issue that i have um and it's yeah and it's it's constant because i know because i've been in a relationship that started out with a client right and i know how dangerous they are i know just how like insidious like what's actually going on there is say more about that what 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 is going on there and how is it insidious the idea that first off like this is a job, right? Right. And so like I I I'm I'm probably not as into it as I'm acting, especially with a guy like like the minute that like they start saying like, oh, like I could take you home, like that's a big one. Like, no, you you couldn't actually. Okay. Like you actually couldn't. Um, stuff like that, like like ideas like, oh, like, you know, I, I, like saving the idea that they could save someone is a big one. It's a big, big issue that I run into because actually like, who are you to save me, right? you don't even have the ability, right? Like you, Ugh. and so, yeah, it, it's so, it's so rough. And, and the problem with that is, you know, I'm very polite. I don't want, and I, and I want to make money, right? I'm very polite and I want to make money and I don't want to shut them down, but you have to, like, you have to shut that down right away. Like I, you can't, I, I've learned, like, I can't let that go for a single second because like the minute that you say anything besides hold up, no, it's not what this is. Like they, they take that as permission to go even further with it, with that, that idea. And just like saying things that are like, like, oh, like, like, oh, like I really like you. And like, I, I didn't sign up for that. You know what I mean? Like I did not sign up for you to love me today. Like that is not what's going on. And so it's rough. Yeah. It just really sounds to me. I mean, it's, it's, there's a poignancy in hearing you describe it this way. And it really sounds to me like these are men who are projecting anima onto you. Well, first of all, it's dehumanizing, right? Like, of course, of course. Like, anytime that someone's putting you on a pedestal, it's so easy for them to knock you right off, and mm-hmm. and then and then you're nothing, and then it's just it's just never it's never gonna go well. <laughs> and but, but they're not seeing you as a full person, right? Of course not. Yeah, and and then they're they're not accepting any part of you. Like like it's just like in it when you get into a relationship with someone like that it pretty much, I think, only ends dangerously. I mean, if you're lucky, right? Like, it, it just, it's just not good. It's just not good. You, you've used the word dangerous a couple of times, and I'm wondering if there are a couple of stories that you might want to share around that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, like, the, the best way for me to describe it would just, would just be, you know, with my ex. Like, when that image that he had of who I was wasn't validated, it really shattered his whole idea of and his whole view of like what his life had become in a way, right? Like you're in a relationship with someone, you have a child with someone. And then when they're not who you thought that they were, it's like, whoa, what's going on? Right. And you feel wronged. And then you feel like, I think he felt like, you know, he felt like he'd been played when in reality, like I I, I was pretty upfront from, from the get go. Right. But, but, that wasn't seen at all. Like that wasn't even ever accepted. The, maybe the better way to describe it would be when you guys had your episode on narcissism and you talked about the echo and how that's all that they could really like, and all the narcissist sees back at them is, is the echo of their own projection. You, you can't really challenge that. And when you do, I think that, you know, some guys get physical, right. And so now, I mean, mm. now he's about to go to jail, you know what I mean? And so, Oh my right, gosh. Right, right. So it's unfortunate. I think it it's uh it's unfortunate that these situations happen, but they're pretty common actually. It's mm. not uncommon for guys to take girls home. The situations are I mean, they can go so many different ways and none of them are ever good. Oh, wow. It sounds like where the honesty is is on the transactional level. Right. And that like any transaction, it can be a basically warm, friendly, enjoyable uh, transaction as long as it stays there. They don't take and you don't accept the projections onto you. Right. 
I'm going to be friendly about anything I do if I can, you know, um, that doesn't mean that I love you. <laughs> and I think that, uh, it's very easy if you're insecure, if you don't have that, that, you know, sureness in yourself to when a pretty woman is being nice to you to be like, Oh, like, this is it. This is my chance. You know, I should save this girl from this, you know, hard, rough life. That, and it's just, it's not like that. It, it just doesn't work. And the archetype of the hero is so powerful in men and that, that, and in this modern world, there aren't a lot of opportunities to really be heroic. Well, so something are. activates, um, you know, maybe, maybe not, <laughs> right. but there are some situations right. like rescuing the damsel in distress, right. Right. you know, is such an archetypal moment that something in some men kind of blows up in those moments. That I don't even really have a problem with, with the idea of them helping, helping me if they have the competency to do that. A lot of my clients have helped me in a lot of ways, right? Like really helped me. Like I have a Snapchat and I'll, like if my car doesn't work, if anything like that, I have any, you know, I, men are fighting to come and help. Right. And I, it, I appreciate it. It's, it's, it's authentic. And like, you know, there's, there's no like transaction even attached to it. Right. And I, I appreciate that. It's when, it's when they're, they're offering something that they actually can't give because they don't even have it for themselves. I think it's, right. mm -hmm, it's a mm -hmm. pure fantasy. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the archetypal world. Sometimes these patterns, these ancient archetypal patterns sweep into people and give them the feeling of something that, mm -hmm. that isn't based in reality, either in their capacities or in the situation. Well, yeah. I mean, there's just no reality attached to it whatsoever. And that for me, I think that's like, you know, why I'm so big on, on the honesty and on like really like not allowing any of that because it just, I can't, I can't handle a, Like if I can't, if I don't know what's going on, like I don't, there's, I can't take it. You know, I, I just want to lift up this uh, perhaps overly facile analogy between your work and mine. And in relation to this in particular, because I think that when we're in a situation where intimacy is offered, be it a relationship, a friendship, a therapeutic situation where you're entering into a new therapy or, or an encounter with uh, a prostitute, what wakes up in us is unmet ancient attachment needs. Like here is a chance for me to get these intimacy needs met. I think that happens to any of us. And part of what, ha you know, and that absolutely wakes up in the therapeutic container and we want it to wake up because it, it opens up this whole world of feeling and um, imagination. And it is the stuff that we work with in therapy. Yeah. And I don't want it to wake up. Well, I'm like, you keep that shit asleep. Right. There's a like frame that. around it, right? We <laughs> want it to wake up in therapy, but we also, I, I was thinking about you're saying, no, hold it. We're not doing that. I mean, there, there is a really tight frame around the therapeutic encounter. I mean, therapists and clients fall in love with each other all the time, but you, you've got to keep it boundaried. So that mm -hmm. so, because those feelings waking up are not bad. And we don't we don't want it to be shameful, and there's a place for it, and it's it's the gold. It is absolutely the gold. But we want to be able to work with it as um, we want to be able to work with it symbolically and psychologically, and not act it out and concretize it. So it seems to me there is a parallel because that is part of the play. I think I hear of what you're doing. Yeah, but you want to keep it in that container. You don't want it to become uh, kind of concretized. Right, very much so. And I think that the minute that I feel like, I mean, any of that's coming out, I mean, I think me, like personally, I'm so sensitive to that, right? Because like, obviously I have my own attachment issues, right? Plenty of them. I'm like so avoidant of any sort of like actual attachment. And so I, I, I know that. And so the minute that that comes up for me, I have to sort of check myself to make sure I'm not being too harsh because I know that if, if it's a step to me, I'm going to be like, yeah, like get the fuck out. Like, mm -hmm. I, I, excuse my French, but um, <laughs> I just like, don't, I don't have any patience for that. And uh, like you said, though, it's part of the play. It's, it, you have to, you have to at least pretend to have the patience for it a little mm -hmm. bit. So it's, it's, it's just definitely a balance. Mm -hmm. What we see in our own practices is the difference between a uh, neurotic transference and a psychotic transference. That if somebody has a neurotic transference, it's a little bit like you're both doing community theater, but he's really, really into it. But some part of you still has a foot 
off the stage. Like we still kind of know that at the end of the show, you know, we're going to go home. In a psychotic transference, somebody has really lost touch with reality and the fantasy is all consuming and they think the fantasy is real. And in that energy, which is what I, I'm imagining you're responding to, when reality begins to disappear and you're holding the reality principle, you know what's going on, you can feel the, um, the danger. Well, right. And that, that's, uh, that, as soon as you said that, what really came up for me right away was this, you know, the relationship I just left, like, like that's exactly what I mean. And, and it's very, I think it's probably pretty rare that that exists on only one aspect of a person's life. Right. Like if you're not really like talking to reality all that much, you're probably not talking to it in, in a bunch of different ways. And, uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, like I got a full up close, like personal picture of what that looks like. And it, you know, it's, it's crazy. I mean, and, and not in like a judgy way, right? Like it's just, it just, it's, it's unpredictable. You can't predict well, it. Well, it's dangerous. I can think of a time in my own practice where a, a client entered into a psychotic transference and they were planning to kill me, that they were sure right. that I oh was right. so dangerous that they really had to kill me um yeah. you know and i had to hospitalize them because they mm. were they were lost in what we call a psychotic transference so it's right. it's dangerous oh yeah it's it's definitely dangerous and um i mean yeah, like i said like my ex is about to go to jail mm. and uh mm. i mean it's, it's the same thing where like i think for me like what i struggle with is is at what point like how do you bring someone out of that like if you even can, right? I mean, I guess like that's the thing is you probably can't like, I mean, at least like from my position, right? Like I can't hospitalize someone, mm -hmm. not really. Mm -hmm. So like it, it's just so dangerous because I know I can't even do anything about yeah. it. Like, and it, it feels like someone's taking this power, I guess, like anytime that that even starts to occur with a client, right? Like at the end of the day, they could do this and there's nothing I can do about it. And it's so, so like scary. It's scary. Yeah. And there's nothing they can do about it because it's this deep unconscious process. They're also right. caught Ooh, in yeah. this kind of short circuiting in themselves. But one of the things that we as therapists will often do is we want to be able to continue to show the dissonance between the fantasy and the reality. So to be able to then introduce elements of, let's say, my personal life or my el elements of what's going to happen after they leave the office to kind of puncture the fantasy, which is part of what I think you do as well. Right, right. Yeah. I, I, but I'm appreciating how, what a very resonant place you're in, Kay, with, because emotions and sex get very heated, very charged, very mixed up with one another. And of course, uh, you know, not that this hasn't happened, but there are psychotherapists, physical contact is not ever part, yes. part of the deal. Right. Sure. So that right. we hold the emotional heat be right. because there is no physical contact. Yeah. And I almost feel like the physical contact almost helps that in a way, right? Because there's just like a way for that energy to get released, if that makes That's sense. Right? Like, interesting. It, like, you know, like afterwards, you know, you're tired, right? Like, you know, it's just this energy that maybe would have gone into like going, crossing that line and like, and getting into that, that, you know, psychotic place is just released mm -hmm. because you just, you know, you're done. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So it, it, I almost feel like it's, it can be better in that way huh. unless it, unless the, the energy isn't released somehow. Right. And like, and then it just builds and mm. yeah. Yeah, that can that can go its own way. But then it builds up again. So in a way, it's a sort of palliative, right? And and I see a lot of clients regularly. You know what I mean? Like I see a lot of them. I see once a week, twice a week. I mean, hmm. a lot, most of the guys that do this a lot do it a lot. Oh. Like I can't imagine how much money a lot of a lot of these men spend. And I'm curious about that part too of how you manage that with clients and in terms of income and taxes and the sort of those societal rules and regs. I'm currently still figuring that out, right? Cause I just re-entered in, into, into this business. So I, I mean, I'm still figuring that out. Uh, I think that, I think that it's, it's handleable, especially in today's day and age. I think that there's a lot of different ways that you can go about paying taxes on, on your funds and, 
you know, figuring out ways to, I guess it's called money laundering. I don't know. <laughs> and I guess that's a technical term. You know, I, for me, like I want to pay taxes, right? I, I want to have like, you know, something that I can point to, right? Obviously, like, to, like how do I pay for myself? And and uh, yeah, I mean, that's I'm still figuring that out. It's it's crazy. Like I'm I'm 21, right? So like most like I I have no idea how any of that works in general for like a normal person, yeah. right? So like I'm still I'm still just learning, and that's like I that's one of those things where like I'm actually really really appreciative of a lot of my clients because they do like a lot of that stuff like they're who teaches me right like like a lot of stuff like that like I, I have no idea how like this insurance things work they do right and and especially if it's someone who I know is like a good guy right like they're, they're pretty helpful you know so I mean you know, I don't have a lot of resources in terms of like family at all right like there's no one for me to, to call up and be like yo like how do I change my tire right like I just don't know so I think that you know that's one of like just one of the ways like that I'm so glad that I have this job, like, cause I, it does give me a huge pool of resources and yeah, like there are guys that are dangerous and, and like that, but then I just cut that off. Right. Um, ideally that's most of the time I can tell before I even see them and then we just don't ever see each mm-hmm, other. Mm-hmm. And it's pretty obvious right away. I mean, it starts with this entitlement in text messages. So like I'll be, you know, I'm busy, right. I do stuff and like, I'll be like going to the post office or whatever. And, I don't answer this guy back right away. And then you get these messages like, guess not, you know, like the passive aggressive entitled, like you're, you know, I'm entitled to get a response from you type thing. And right away, I know. Mm -hmm. Don't don't go there. Yeah. No. You know, um, I asked you before and we moved away from it. I would like to hear about your bad days too. My bad days. Um, They're interesting, I guess, because it, you know, nothing, nothing dramatic or bad is happening. Right. And so for me, like, it's like, it's not that bad. Right. But, um, I think that it, it, they end up just showing up with me doing things maybe slightly subconsciously, but also sort of consciously just to make myself late. Right. That's, I do that all the time, actually. Like I'll just go off and do something that I definitely don't need to do and end up missing the appointment. Um, there's just no motivation. I'm not happy about it. Like, you know, I think that on those days, I'm more likely to not be assertive and, and to accept things that I wouldn't normally like. What are you, what um, are you feeling on those days? I don't know. I really don't. I, I think trapped a little bit, but not, not in such a serious way. I guess it's just, you know, anytime that you have to do something you don't want to do so, sort of sucks. Right. And so I just feel like that. And and also just, I think sometimes, you know, especially when I'm saying yes to things that I know I don't want to say yes to. And like, that's my own issue, right? Like I can't even blame the client for that. Like, that's all me. That's just really, that's really hard. Right. Because then like I put myself in this position. Now I'm uncomfortable now. Like there's consequences, of course, whatever those have to be. Right. And like a lot of times that's just like me not really providing a good, as good of a service as I normally would and that affecting my reputation. Right. And so the bad days, I mean, normally end up with me saying like, like for me, like I don't ever do appointments for longer than an hour. I cut it off right then. Like, like that's just all I have. Like for me personally, I'm not really, I don't have all that energy. You know, I'm, <laughs> I like, I'm very laid back. I like to relax. I am just not, I don't have the energy for like a two hour appointment with someone. And sometimes I think with my wallet and not with my head. Right. And cause two hour appointments obviously pay twice as much i think the, the those days it just feels very exhausting i think more than anything else it's just it's just exhausting and the hours are weird right like <laughs> you know like in terms of like figuring out when you're gonna sleep is actually like sort of rough right like because like when are you gonna sleep like at what time because like people want to see you at random points throughout the day so like my sleep schedule is like totally whacked mm. Is there anything else if you didn't have to earn money that you would really like to be doing? Oh, totally. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Right. Like, like this is not, this was not uh, my dream as a child. You know what I mean? Like this is definitely, if I could do other things, I would do them. And I think that that's probably true for, for most, most girls in the business. Um, I, I'm really into like history, right? I'm really into like psychology. I mean, there's so many things that I would totally love to do. This life for me is just like a, it's a consequence of decisions that I mean, just like anything is right. Like any, any job that you end up with, any life situation that you end up with is, is a result of, of decisions. And so I definitely, I, I don't, 
I really, really do everything I can not to view it as something that is happening to me. You know, I don't, I don't want to be a victim of, of, of things that I'm actually not a victim of at all, you know? So I think that, you know, that actually helps a lot. And also like, you know, this is a really, this is a really old job, right? Like this is like, and it's no other animals do this, right? Like, like it's a very human, very old experience. And, and that's really priceless. Like, I, I think that I understand duality and like hold, like, you know, I think you guys say the tension of the opposites, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what we say. <laughs> <laughs> I think that uh, this sort of work helps a lot with just like being able to hold that. You know, oh, that's really interesting. When you were talking about the ancient dynamic of prostitution, there was an author named Nancy Qualls Corbett who wrote a book called The Sacred Prostitute and examined the archetype mm-hmm. of this. And she traces it back to some of the ancient Greco Roman temples that, for instance, when men would return for war and they were made savage and, in a sense, inhuman, right. they would often be brought to some of the temples and it was the priestesses. Right, using uh, body work and religion and sexuality to bring them back to a kind of humanized dynamic in themselves. And so I imagine that some of the men that you work with, there is a healing dimension. Absolutely. Like, and, and you can really, when that's happening, you can really feel that, um, you know, especially because like a lot of them, like they want a massage too. And I'm like, I don't, I don't know what I'm doing, but sure. You know, I mean, it's a... <laughs> the other day I had someone fall asleep and it was actually like really like sweet, you know, like, you know, I mean, like, it's just, we didn't even get to like the point, right? Like I just like gave him a massage and he fell asleep. Like I'm fine with that, whatever I have my money. Right. So, no. yeah. So I think a lot of, a lot of guys just like want to feel healed in, in some way. I think, I think, I think that's definitely true. That a lot of them are coming because they, they want to feel connected to a human thing. Like they want, I mean, everyone needs human connection. It's like a basic need. And so if that's not getting met in, a lot, I think a lot of guys are going to come to come to a, a provider, but um, I, I wonder what women go to though, because obviously women don't really use sex workers. Mm-hmm. You know, the word that comes up for me is received, and that men want to feel received. Right. And and if we think about it, just biologically, you know, women's uh, physiology and having vaginas receives. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we we receive semen t- and become impregnated. Right. The p- safe place to go, whether it's due to you know the the war trauma from you know mythology in ancient times, or some part of their own psyche mm-hmm. of feeling accepted, understood, and received emotionally and physiologically. And I wonder if that is a you know sort of a big unmet need and and kind of what is in the shadow a lot of the time for men it's a huge part of it and and i think the one thing i want to say is is that that's a huge part i think for the men that i see right um at the lower levels of the economic spectrum it's i think that there's a different thing that you see and i think that that's like the objectification of women right and that, I mean, I don't really deal with that just because I, I, I don't deal with it, right? But like, I definitely think that, that that's the other aspect of this where that's not really something that I deal with anymore. But it's de- especially on the East Coast. That's like one of the reasons why I don't work on the East Coast is it's a very different vibe. It's like, it's much less about being received and much more about like entitlement. One of my imaginations before talking to you today would have been that some men want something that's that's pretty violent and objectifying. Have you seen that? Yes, and and no, in a way. So, I think that the men who do want something violent, it's very much a fantasy that they want, right? Like it's they don't actually want like 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 let's use a rape fantasy, right? Like that's pretty common. Um, I can get into that personally, like like I'm fine with that. And so as long as it's laid out. And like, we know what we're going to do. And like, yeah, this is what you want to do. I'm fine with that. I actually like, I can enjoy that as well. So like, it's not violent because it's not, you know, it's consenting. Now, when I haven't personally, knock on some wood, I've never really in- encountered a client that was going to take something that, well, well, in a way. So I think the only issue that I've ever had that was close to that is like somebody not paying me after one time. 
And that feels like total shit. Like that is like the worst feeling ever. But yeah, but but then again, you, you know, physically I'm fine, right? So like it, it's it, even emotionally, you know, at the end of the day, I'm okay. And so that that's the worst thing that I've ever really come into contact with. Uh, I think that I, w- I would hope that it's more rare than people think in terms of like, I think that you're more likely to get actually sexually violently assaulted in your everyday life than doing the job I do. Um, and just like from being like a college student and like from like being a, like a female, like just traveling and doing so. I mean, I've ran into way more sexually violent situations outside of this job than I ever have in it. Hmm. I would say that that's probably statistically almost true too. Cause like if you're, if you're entering into this, like you're entering into this consensually, like, you know what I mean? Like, you know mm-hmm. that you're getting someone who does this. It has a frame around it. Right. Right. And I think if you want to be sexually violent with someone, you're just going to take someone and do that. So it seems in the dimension of healing and, and I hear this in my, in my practice, I have a lot of men in my practice, but the men that come to you, and want to know whether or not they're physically attractive um, or physically potent or physically desirable. And, and that's, incredi- that's an incredible need because their wives, girlfriends, or the culture don't tell them that. Yeah, I think, or it's because of a belief that they have, right? Because I think a lot of them, they don't even ask me if they think, I'm, they just assume that I think that they're unattractive. Like it's, there's no, right. there's not even a question. They're just like, oh, I know this right. about myself. And I'm like, hold up. Like a lot of times, a lot of times it's actually just not true. It's really interesting to me as to like what, what sort of message that they're getting and where they're getting it from. Cause I really, I mean, I just don't know. Well, I think that in the culture of men, that attractiveness is more universally assigned to women. Women are beautiful. Women are attractive. And men are just these kind of hairy beasts that are tolerated in the environment. But also something that is very powerful is that most men feel that they cannot bring the full measure of their sexuality to their wives and their girlfriends, that it's going to be too much, too frequent, too intense, and that to come to someone, whether it's a prostitute or, or a lover, and be able to be the full measure of one's sexual self is, is a great longing for many men. Yeah, and I think the, the thing with that is that it, it might be actually just too much for their, for their, I mean, like, you know what I mean? Like, like for me, I could, like a lot of these guys, like I can take that, like I said, for an hour, right? But like, if I had to deal with like all the time, like, like being in a relationship with them, like, like the sexual drives that some of like these guys have, like, no, no way. I mean, there's just no way that I would be able to do that. Um, and so, I mean, I feel for them, but I feel like the, the, a big part of that is feeling entitled to have your sexual needs met all the time. Because mm-hmm. at the yep. end of the day, it's not going to happen. Like this is, this is, you're not actually entitled to that. And I think a lot of guys really struggle with that, with feeling like, oh, like I shouldn't have to feel this way when it, that's just a part of life. Well, um, one of the things that we um, talked about before the session is whether or not you had a dream to share. Yeah. Because at the end of each of our podcasts, we, we talk about a dream. And if it's okay, totally, um, I will read a dream that you had shared with us, if you like. Mm-hmm. Before we switch to the dream, is there anything else that you want to say? No, I don't. I don't think so. I don't think so. Okay. Do you feel like because you discovered us through the podcast, right, right? And going for you to take a moment to just go inside and to ask your soul because you really wanted a soulful conversation to come forward. Do you feel there's anything in your soul that still wants to have a voice? Yeah, actually, I think like the the initial reason that I had actually emailed you guys in the gecko was i i really wanted i think your opinion on if you guys think that this could be healthy you know to do as a job i think that was my and i think now that i started working again i have like my own sort of inklings um as to that but uh i think that that really was 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 like sort of my question and you know if, if this could be if you could do this and like if it you could do it and come out maybe not unscathed but like like just you know, functional almost. And what are your inklings about that, Kay? Um, there's a difference between something being like actively harmful and then not being ideal, right? Like this is definitely not ideal, right? Like if you can do something else, you should probably do that. You know, I mean, this is not the healthiest situation that you could probably put yourself in. Um, but at the same time, like I just, I don't think that, 
I think that you can be healthy in spite of it, but I think you're definitely going to be healthy in spite of it. It's not, you know, there's no way to have this be a healthy, beneficial thing for your life. Right. What, what I'm paying the most attention to is, you know, that what you said was, yeah, I'd love to do a whole bunch of different things. Right, right. You know, which, you know, kind of makes me think that there's a longing or a yearning for something else, something more. Right. That there's a, a desire uh, t- to move ahead in what we call the individuation process. Right. Yeah. And I think to me, you know, uh, uh, you know, financially, like this is actually sort of the best path for me to do that. Right. Like, you know, you sort of can't you can't do do these things without the qualifications. You can't get the qualifications without having the money and ability to like get educated. And and I think like the the my goal hopefully is to, you know, be able to like put myself into school again, eventually. I mean, who knows if that's going to actually happen or not, but I I mean, you know, just to be able to, to move forward in that aspect and it's just to move forward in my life, like with my daughter and like, you know, being able to like get, you know, out of this relationship completely. And, And I think that this job can give, can give people that. Yeah, I mean, my my thought would be something like, I mean, obviously, there's the uh, physical dangers that that come along with the work, and and you've said that you don't feel particularly exposed to those yeah, currently. Yeah. And, but I'm 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 wondering about, and that's partly why I was interested in what your bad days are like. Like, is there a psychological toll? And and I think it could there could be, and it could come from several different places. And and partly just the work of having to be what someone else wants you to be. Yeah. For that. Yeah. I think part of it is, you know, not having understandably and like appropriately, just not having the total maturity to know what I can handle and what I can't. Right. So like in these situations where like, you know, every once in a while, like uh, really bad days, I thought I could totally do this and it would be fine. And like, then I find out and eh, probably not so smart. And like probably actually couldn't take that today. And uh, I think that, you know, you just have to learn from that. Like there's really no, I mean, this is what, you know, this is what I do. So the only way for me to really handle that is to just like learn from it. Okay. Now next time I know maybe like probably not to do that, like to have Mm -hmm. maybe more firm limits. And I think that you have to learn that the hard way and it sucks to learn that the hard way, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was really touching to me a few minutes ago when you referenced Echo. Yeah. And in some sense, that's your job. Right, right. And, (laughs) and, yeah, and you do have to, you can protect your psyche a little bit by having those strong boundaries, it sounds like. Right, and even if I feel like, it's like for me, I'm, I want people, I mean, I I want to like do what someone wants, you know what I mean? I, I do. And so it's just like having this rule where even if I feel like in this moment, yeah, I'll say yes to a two hour appointment. Not, it just has to be like a rule, right? Like, I just can't do it. Mm-hmm. So I think that being resilient to this part of your journey mm-hmm. is, <laughs> is part of the part. Right. Yeah, one of the ways that we're resilient to any challenging part of our journey is to know that the journey is larger than where we are now. Oh, yeah. That you're not at the end of your journey. Right. Yeah, and I, I think that just knowing that, like, for me – um you know, I, I don't want to get into this at the end of the podcast, but, uh, you know, I sent you guys that email on, on this book called The Red House. And um, it's just like this incredible masterpiece um, uh, on prostitution and, and on what that journey really is and, and just really how it shows up. And I think that, that for me, just like really getting in touch with like that aspect of it and just the fact that like this journey is the same journey that women have had for as long as humans have existed, like this has been, a, it's a truly female, especially, you know, for me, I, I, I don't have a mom, right? So like my connection to the feminine has always been very, very distant. That's not so true anymore, right? Like this is, this is yeah. very close, very, fe- like, like there's no other way to, for it to be. So I, mm. I think that, that that's been very helpful for me. That that made me think of a question I had a little while ago. You said, so men may go to a, a prostitute to be received. And you said, well, what do women do? Right. And I thought, what do you do, Kay, when you want to be received? I I don't really know. I mean, I guess I guess for me, I uh, I get sort of archetypal with it, you know. Um, it's sort of, 
you know, when you don't have anywhere, I mean, that's sort of the only place that you can go a lot of times. I think that for me in my life, that's the only place, that's the only thing that's been very effective and helpful. And what does that look like? What do you, what do you mean when you say that? Uh, like reading literature like that, like getting in touch with like, just like, like that whole idea, even like, just like remembering, like, actually, like this is really like inherent to like being a person. And, and, you know, and, you know, Alan Watts, I listen to a lot of Alan Watts, <laughs> um, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, just sort of like putting that sort of, you know, cause especially cause like, you know, this can be so materialistic and so superficial, like just getting that deeper, like sort of like aspect of reality, like really helpful. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So what you're saying is that you work hard to make sure that your life is meaningful and that you mine levels of meaning from philosophy, from art, from literature, from people who inspire you. And from my daughter, right? You know, I also have a baby. Um, So, yeah, yeah, Yeah. so a lot of what I do is just sort of remember, like, everything. Like, I wouldn't need to do any of this if I didn't have a kid, right? Like, like I wouldn't need to. I mean, I probably still would, right? Because I would need to eat. But, like, uh, not to the level that I I do it now. Like, like I, I work a lot right especially right now because i'm just trying to like save up money to like transition in my life like i'm working a lot and so you know just being able to like come back and like be able to like the other day like when i came back like back and and saw my my little girl like just be able to like give her gifts and like and just like be there and like have her enjoy them and like like that to me is just like makes it all worth it to be the bountiful mother right right it's so important yeah that you didn't have. Right. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I appreciate your saying that you, you go to, to books and ideas. And, and I think that is a lot what a lot of us do mm-hmm. when we've missed the personal connection with a parent. It's sort of like ideas become your mother. Right. And, and I'm also noting it's not a personal connection. Right. No, right. And that's a lot of the men. What you said is a lot of men come to you because they want that personal intimate right right yeah it's uh it's uh interesting to sort of navigate through like my own you know issues separate from that and then of course like being able to provide something that at least feels like that to them this might be a time to transition to the dream (laughs) the dream okay so when I'll, i'll start off with like when i was in high school i worked at this pet store um it was a very small pet store it was it was a pretty cool pet store actually like uh they had a lot of like exotic animals, but um, and so I'm in this dream, and I am with my my daughter who's in her stroller, and I'm with like my best friend, like my actual like r- like best friend who like I know, um, and we're talking to the lady who works there who I don't know, and it and it's not like the same layout. It's like definitely not the same pet store, um, and I look over in the corner and there's this alligator in this cage. And we had a real alligator in the pet store that, you know, it was way too big for the cage. Uh, I mean, they, we just, uh, they, it was hard to get rid of, right? Like, where do you put this alligator? And so, oh right. And so people would come in and they would pay two bucks to have me feed it mice. And even if like this poor little girl had just ate, like, you know what I mean? And it's just, it, it was rough, but um, it was, it was a rough situation. Just know even what to do with it. But um, so I'm looking in this dream and there's this alligator and I look down and my daughter's not in her stroller and this alligator is eating this piglet. And it just clicked in my head for like a split second that like, oh, like like it it wasn't even like, I didn't even think this. I just knew in my dream in that moment, like that my daughter was the pig, I guess. Like, like, like there's just like that connection there, but it it left right away. And then I started looking for my daughter and uh, I, I leave the pet store. This lady doesn't come back, by the way, the lady that was working there. She's just like, I don't know, off. And I'm running through this office building, which is where the pet store was. It was like like, like a, in a mall almost, right? Like it was like one little you know, store in this building. And I'm looking around and there's this group of like children the same age as my kid running across like the hallway. And I'm like looking, you know, at all of them and like my daughter's not there. And then I, I feel very strongly that we need a canine unit to find her. Cause I feel like maybe she's like in the ventilation system. Cause she likes to crawl in you know weird spaces. And I don't know, like maybe she's like 
in, in up in there maybe she's like I, mean, I, I don't know right so I, I feel like we need a canine unit and of course like I <laughs> in my dream I have weed in my car so I'm you know I get on the phone and I call my friend and I'm like hey like I need you to to get the weed out of my car so we can call the police and get the canine unit here right because otherwise like then that's a whole different issue and so yeah and then I I woke up pretty much right then but it was it was really vivid is the one thing so I don't dream uh, I mean I'm sure maybe I do dream often I don't know but I don't ever really remember them but this like, it was very 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 vivid and it was um it was really upsetting and scary no, would you say no, or okay. it was a, it was more just uh it was just strange to me that I remember to dream at all I mean very okay. strange and um it was just weird I, I felt like it was we I think it was disturbing in the dream but when I woke up I mean even in the dream, I, I guess I should say, I didn't think that she had died or that she was like going to mm, die. Mm -hmm, uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, okay. It was more just more about losing her myself rather than her getting mm -hmm. lost. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, when I woke up, it was just weird. It was just like, what is mm -hmm. that? Like, and I listened to a whole bunch of your guys' podcasts <laughs> on like, like the dream animals and stuff. I'm like, what is going on here? Yeah, so. yeah. And did you have any ideas? I did some research, uh, and I guess uh, the devouring mother idea. But even that, I don't, I don't know how to connect it with my own life. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, I definitely understand that, like, the alligator is probably me, right? Like, but I don't really know how. I just know that it's like likely, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and tell me, just a kind of point of information. You said you were with your best friend in the beginning of the dream. Can you just mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about him or her? <sighs> yeah. So. I can't remember which best friend I was with in this dream. Um, I have two of them. Um, I ha I'm not, I mean, I'm obviously like I don't live where I grew up, so I don't talk to them so much anymore, but um, very chill, very laid back, you know. Um, I mean, they're just I mean, pretty similar to me, I guess, in terms of like personality, you know, um, but. A, su a supportive presence. Right, right. I mean, yeah, I, I, I'm always with one of my friends in my dreams, I should say, like always, like I'm never just like by myself. Well, one of my first thoughts uh, as Deb and Joseph are gathering theirs is, is I was really struck by the image from your high school experience of working in the pet store of this alligator, mm -hmm. this uh, very instinctual animal um, in this uh, too small enclosure. Yeah, I felt so uh, bad for this alligator. Mm -hmm. And it reminds me a little bit of you talking about growing up in West Virginia and how it just, mm -hmm. you know, you, you know, you were there was a constraining quality. I think uh, I should mention uh, that I think maybe it's probably more about the relationship that I was still in at the time as well. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah you, were, you, you, you were in a too small too small container that's happened to that's happened to several times yeah. in your life oh yeah that w where you are is not big enough for you and then there's this idea about people paying money to uh see this animal sort of f kind of forced to eat even if it doesn't want to which reminded me perhaps a little bit of prostitution yeah actually i didn't even think about that wow mm -hmm. I went immediately to a book uh one of our favorite references called the Book of Symbols, and it's uh, published by Tashin, T-A-S-C-H-E-N. We'll put it in the show notes. And of course, I wanted to look up the symbol of the alligator, which they list as crocodile, but I think six of one, half a dozen of another for, <laughs> for our purposes here today. And uh, it's an ancient symbol. It was an Egyptian god. It's a living yeah, it's a living, um, they have one in the Metropolitan Museum uh, of Art uh, in the temple of the Egyptian, in the room where the temple is. So h here it is, this primordial living dinosaur uh, with a very thick hide. And there's, there's a quote from the book of Job in the Bible, who can penetrate its double coat of mail? Who can open the doors of its face? There is terror all around its teeth. And of course, it's a threshold creature. It, it lives in the water, but it breathes air. It's a reptile, so its body temperature is dependent upon the environment. Right. <laughs> Just like mine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and din and uh, dinosaurs, <laughs> crocodiles are actually good mothers. 
Uh, they hatch their, their eggs, and she says the mother gently rolls unhatched eggs between her tongue and palate to allow her young to break out, and then carries them gently down to the water from her onshore nest and will fear yeah. to protect them from predators for a year or more. I'm remembering like a lot. I, I was born in Florida. I spent the first ah. few years of my life in Florida. Um, right. And I, uh, and I've always thought of lizards as like my spirit animal. Like whenever anyone's asked like lizards, like, I'm, like I love lizards. Um, and so, yeah, it's actually pretty interesting. Like uh, mm -hmm. I, I've seen alligators mother their babies a lot, actually. Have um, you? Just from being in Florida. I mean, you, they're, they're everywhere. Um, and so, yeah, I, I never really thought about that. But like, like as soon as like hearing you say that, like I'm, all these images of like all the times I've seen alligators with their babies are coming up. Uh, I'm aware that in your dream, your alligator is not the same as what I just read about crocodiles because, right. because it is imprisoned and it is in a cage that it has way outgrown. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and its wildness is, uh, has been terribly constrained. It was kind of fat too, like you know what I mean, like it, like it, it, like that that toad in Pan's Labyrinth that I mentioned, like it was very much like that, like it was very mm. like like overfed in a way. Mm -hmm. Say more about Pan's uh, Labyrinth because I remember that scene so vividly. Great movie, love it, love it so much. Um, we love it too. <laughs> Guillermo del Toro was amazing. I, I'm not sure that I do love it. I know. I, I, really remember, I remember that. <laughs> um, you know I what I that. what I'm aware of is that these lush scenes, and I remember the the girl who's just at a threshold age between childhood and adolescence, if I'm remembering this right, uh, is supposed to come to an adult party, and she's in a dress her mother has made for her, her first dress up dress, and she goes running around through. Uh, being beckoned by this giant toad that lives in a tree. But uh, in reality, of course, she's covered, you know, she emerges covered with mud from her imaginary uh, quest for this uh, special toad or frog. And so it's a, it, Pan's Labyrinth is a trauma movie. Yeah, well, uh, so is life, I guess, right? Like, I feel like, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I, I definitely, I, I see that. And I, I see it as a trauma movie, but I also see, like, uh, well, first of all, like, that scene was always one of my favorite scenes in the movie. I had no idea why. I, I guess because, like, all, like, the jewels, like, the, you know, they're sparkly. And, and um, <laughs> I don't know, I like reptiles, I guess. So, like, I, always one of my favorite scenes. But um, I guess I, in my head, the way when I watched it, I didn't view it as imaginary. I guess would be the thing. Mm -hmm. so I viewed that as having actually happened, and then now she's just covered in mud. Mm -hmm. So a real encounter with this, right? Right, with this giant toad, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And and your your alligator was sort of had that same vibe. You said it, it like it was exactly the same. Like it it like the same like t like color tone and everything. Mm -hmm. So this alligator in the pet store where you worked was not actually dangerous, but in the dream, um, <laughs> you know, I, I, they are dangerous. It, yeah, I almost got. Uh, yeah, I definitely uh, had some close calls. I have a sister who's oh. an amateur yeah. herpetologist, and uh, she once brought home a baby alligator. They'll mess you and, up, and uh, it was only maybe <laughs> I don't know eighteen inches or two feet long, but it was ferocious. And as soon as my mother came home, uh, back went the alligator to the pet store. So that they are wild and they are... There's an indiscriminateness to it. And, and so this one in the dream is, is eating a, a baby pig that has some, some connection with your daughter. Yeah, and uh, I mean, my daughter loves pigs. Um, right now, like, she's uh, an animal lover completely. Um, and... Uh, you know, she's all cute and pink and stuff. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know if it's because she looks like a pig. Or well, you know, pigs also are sacred animals and often represent very much the feminine, the maternal. Uh, I think the pig is Demeter's animal, and Demeter really embodies a lot of the mother arc. Yeah. I'd like to venture a little uh, more sober okay. interpretation of the dream. Yeah. So in your life and in the dream, there is a very primordial force, the most primal instinct, 
that is being contained, it's being housed properly, and there's a feeling that you can manage it and that the unconscious can manage it. But there's a little ambivalence about that. What's the cost of managing these ancient primal instincts? And as a prostitute, you live in the world of primal instincts. Yeah. Those are your clients, those that are your own. And how are those things managed so that there's enough that's fed so that the instinct doesn't become dangerous, but there's a kind of cost to it. Mm -hmm. And that while on one sense there is a feeling it can be managed, there's also another sense that it can be dangerous and that you want to protect your daughter from the instinctive dynamics that you are living in right now. You don't want her to be injured by them mm -hmm. in some way. And so just the thought in the dream that she might be injured or, or something that is young and innocent right. could be gobbled up by these powerful, indifferent instincts. Yeah, I think it, it's sort of like a danger to her on both sides, right? Because she's in danger on the inside of that, that, you know, that little aquarium thing and on the outside too, right? Like it's like in both situations, I can't find her. Like in one situation, she's getting eaten, right? Like that's not ideal. And then in the second situation, like I can't even find her. Right. And there's also the issue of who's the baby and who's the piglet. Because the piglet and your daughter are both young and innocent and defenseless. Mm-hmm that are in a world of caged beasts and they have to be monitored and that your young and innocent self mm -hmm. also needs to be tended in a world where things that are young and innocent can just be eaten. Right. And how do you do that? How, how do you protect the young and innocent soul inside of you? And sort of eaten for the uh, entertainment of others. Yeah. Yeah, and it's so funny uh, what just came up for me when you said that, Joseph, is uh, the idea of me need to, feeling like I need to call a dog, right? Yes. Like feeling like I like, like in that moment being like, okay, like we need to call the cops. <laughs> like just for me, like what? Like you want to call who? But, mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's, it's, it's interesting to like, think like, okay, we need a German shepherd. <laughs> yeah. But to find your innocence, that if we think of the baby scooting away instinctively, in the inner world, it means that you're out of touch with her. Where is my inner baby? Where's my inner innocence? And I don't want to tolerate this world where my inner in innocence is, is out of touch. So now we have to bring in the instincts that have such refined sense of smell that they can smell out the innocent part of me and retrieve it back to me so I can take good care of it. And the conflict there is, the anesthetizing effect of the marijuana could sidetrack the part of you that wants to keep you in touch with your innocence. And I think that that's true. Oh, totally. Totally. I mean, uh, this is not, uh, I mean, like for this job in general, like it's not one that people do sober generally. Um, mm -hmm. Not that I've seen. Definitely uh, some anesthetics are appreciated. You feel me? Sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting that the dogs are associated with the police, which can sort of be in dreams like that part of the psyche that enforces the rules, right? you know, that enforces right and wrong. Yeah. So it's sort of the instincts in service to this idea of, yeah. of right and wrong. And later. And yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I think Joseph, you know, laid that out really beautifully, kind of the, the innocent part of yourself. Mm -hmm. And it's also possible, and this, you know, could be related, but, but your daughter could also, re well, she could represent your actual daughter. She could represent yeah. the young and innocent part of her, yourself. It could also represent a fairly recent new attitude in the psyche that's endangered by this kind mm -hmm. of primal instinct. Yeah. And it's interesting that she is in, in the dream. Uh, you think she might be in the vent system, the ventilation. Yeah, that's, that's weird to uh, me. I, she would have found these pipes, in effect, uh, to crawl through. Right. Uh, yeah, what is that? <laughs> well, what, what's a ventilation system? It takes heat and cold and allows passage. 
Well, and it's it's where you know air travels along a ventilation system. So maybe something to do with spirit. Interesting. I mean, it reminds me a little bit of um, Cal Shedd's thesis about the spirit having to be kind of secreted away in response to trauma. Mm-hmm. So kind yeah. of going back to what Joseph was saying, a young tender, innocent part of ourselves in the face of trauma has to be taken by the psyche and put away somewhere safe. We'll put that book in the show notes too. It's called The Inner World of Trauma. And uh, Donald Kalshed's a Jungian analyst who I think understands trauma at a depth and with a truth that um, is deeply resonant for a lot of people. So coming back to the inner a child um, in the presence of this primordial, almost godlike instinct, which is incredibly amoral and indifferent the way alligators are, it has an instinct, the baby has an instinct to protect itself, mm-hmm. just like all small creatures, right. like you know, little lizards and skinks, the way they'll zoop up you know, a wall and into a little crevice. Um, they know how to survive. And when I think of the ventilation system almost being like a big go- gopher hole. Right. Community. Yeah. The maze of tunnels, which are used to protect and to house. So what it tells me is that your inner innocent self is alive and well, that its instincts are intact, that it goes into hiding when this primeval world gets a little too chompy, mm-hmm. a little too hungry. Yeah. Um, and sometimes you're interested in the alligator and sometimes you're interested in the innocent self. And at this point, when you had the dream, which I think was a little while back, mm-hmm. there also was an interest in, uh, I need to find my innocent self right now. Like that's more of a priority yeah. than feeding, feeding the gators. I feel a little bit inclined to think that my daughter might actually represent my daughter. In the dream, which is almost so much worse, <laughs> in a way, like uh, I almost and it, and, and it could it could be yeah, both. The, okay, yeah, so. I think it's probably both. Yeah, and right now you're in a conflict, you know, with uh, the the baby's father. So of course, you know where she is and whose hand she's in, and tracking her is huge. It, it's funny that in the dream I want to call the police because the police came later that day. Oh, yeah, wow. so like, yeah, that wow. is so interesting. That wow. yeah, yeah, wow. yeah. That is really interesting. And I, and I called them. So like it. Yeah. So, wow. Yeah. So, oh, so, okay. so interesting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That is really interesting. <laughs> yes. It says. The, gator right. could be your, the baby's father's primal instinct right. that you're worried about him having access. Right. Yeah. That's so crazy. And I want to say on that note, you know, to me, one of the really, really important things about this dream is the way the dream ego functions, because the dream ego is immediately alert and aware when the baby goes missing and is prioritizing that and then says, we need to get rid of the anesthetizing agent so that we can call on the helpful instincts. So it does tell me that your your ego is relating to these dangerous inner contents mm-hmm. um, in a way that is protective of right. the uh, innocent part of the psyche. And I'm interested in the progression of where the dream goes from the alligator to we need the canine unit and all of the archetypal symbolism of a dog. First of all, it's a mammal. And the ability, as mentioned before, to sniff things out. Uh, dogs are man's best friend. And, of course, there's a, a lot in mythology and history and uh, all the rest of it of a domesticated uh, or, or an instinctual capability that we befriend, and it befriends us. So it's a friendly relationship, a helpful relationship, unlike the alligator. <laughs> well, yeah, I know in, in um, you know, being Puerto Rican in, in, in the native Taino mythology, there's, they have this dog that, that is said to, to guard, like, so everyone goes into this cave, right? And um, like their origin story and, and this dog guards and uh, it actually ends up turning to stone when the sun comes up, uh, long story, but uh, and anyways, like this, this, you know, the dog guards people over. Mm, mm-hmm. yeah. That's, that's, guards that's them lovely. from the sun actually. So, huh. 
Well, there's so much more undoubtedly we could talk right. about, but I feel like the uh, there's been a natural denouement to the conversation. <laughs> and I want to thank you so, so much. Thank Kay, you. Thank you so much. Wow. For letting us um, into your world a little bit, for learning about your inner life and what it's like to live in the land that you live in. Yeah. And how much soul there is in the land that you inhabit. Yeah, there, there really is. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. All right, well, I'll uh, I'll hit you guys up later, I guess, or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> we'd like to, we'd like to right. hear from you again. All right, thank you. dedicate this episode to Kay and all women who walk with her. We hold you in our hearts. May you walk your path in 
dignity and grace. May your heart guide you safely. May you tend a vision of home that patiently waits for your arrival.